So hello there and welcome to part three of the Assignment Journey podcast. This part we're going to talk all about researching and also evaluating the sources of information that you have. In parts one and part two we talked about using the assignment brief and structure and planning to get you to this point. So once you've done a little bit of that now it's time to get involved in the research and also trying to get your head around all the information that there is out there. So to join me Alexander Wood in this particular episode I have two very special academic librarian guests. So first of all, I have Sally Forrest, and second, I have Liz White. So thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you. Okay, you're very welcome. So to get right into the podcast, the first question that I want to ask the two special guests are, when do you recommend that students actually start doing their research? Well, I would say that the very first moment that you get your assignment brief from your academic Don't leave it too late, start right at the very beginning. And I'd add to that that if you're able to sort of plan what you're going to do in each week leading up to your hand-in date, uh, that would be a really good idea as well, just to get that uh, extra structure in your planning. I think that's all very crucial, to start as early as possible and try and get your head around it. So if you want advice on how to start planning your assignment, like I said, check out part one of this series, but do try and research as early as possible. In part two of the series, we found that actually when you're making your structure, it should really be reinforced by some research. So, should students do anything before they start researching? I think, again, it's really reading that assignment question and understanding what's being asked of them. Depending on the level of study that you're at, you could be doing something that is quite short um, in terms of word count, or you could be writing a really extended piece of work. So before you do anything, you need to look, what is it that I'm actually being asked to produce and in that respect how does that influence what I'm going to find and where I'm going to find it. And then identify what the key words are in that question which I'm sure you've gone over in your first podcast absolutely. Of course. But once you've got those keywords then you can start planning your search strategy which I'm sure we'll talk about more as we go through the podcast. So you said about planning search strategy that's a great time to ask that question really so what is a search strategy then? Well, I think as Liz has just said, what you need to do is um, identify those key keywords or phrases from your assignment title and start to build up a mind map. I always say write things down on a piece of paper, identify the keywords from your assignment title and then think about are there other ways of expressing this, are there any other Mm. synonyms or um, phrases that might mean the same thing. I know when I was a student, I used to love saying them, so I used to just point them into Google, have a look at the different ways that you could express the phrase, yeah. and just put them into my, re- my search engine, and it come up with different results, because if there's a different way of saying it, that might be the particular way that the author of a journal has said it. Yeah. Absolutely, you can't predict mm. how the author's going to have said it, so you need to, you know, you need to cover all bases, basically, don't you? But you also need to remember that, especially when you're looking for academic material, that a lot of journals or databases assign specific keywords. So there are often is a thesaurus inbuilt within a a database or within a journal. So as you develop your research skills, you'll start to pick up and identify what those key um, professional, you know, if it's related to health, there may be a very specific way of saying something, if it's related to engineering, it may be that it's a procedure or a process that is has got a very specific terminology around it. So really find them keywords and start plugging them in and planning what those keywords are from the, from the get-go and also use some synonyms. So you said about students who pull them into search training, so where can students go to actually do their research? Well, the first place would be to uh, look at your reading list because Mm. obviously there's um, key resources on there for you already, so uh, key books and plus extra reading, so that would be a good place to to start. You've got the library catalogue where you can search for the general topic, but then you can move on to using resources like Library Plus and the the databases that we've got. So I think what you said about the reading list is really crucial because I know that when I was a student, I would always start off at the reading list and I'd read a few few books on it and then I'd go from there and see what sources they've recommended and also i get my head around the topic from those resources. Would you recommend just using the reading list? Would you recommend going elsewhere? No, I'd recommend reading beyond it. I think um, that a reading list is really just a starting point. It's an indication from your academic of titles that they are aware are good on that topic. One of the things we often get complaints about is that there aren't sufficient copies of 
book on reading mm. lists. But I would counter that with, well, there'll be another book on the shelf next door, if you like, um, that would be just as good. So read beyond your reading list. It's also a really good way to show wider reading. Absolutely. Mm. And yeah. I can imagine that if a lecturer has 100 papers to read and everyone uses the reading list, it might be quite boring. Whereas if you can show off and use some different sources, that's what I always tried to do when I was a student, is try and get as many different types of sources as possible. Absolutely. So I would, I would recommend that students, after they've gone beyond their reading list and exploring the library catalogue, um, especially when you get to your second, third, final year of um, your degree, you really need to be looking beyond what's in the library catalogue and think about journal articles. And the best place to start with that would be to use Library Plus, mm -hmm. which obviously is the library's main search engine. There are other search engines out there for different subjects. There are some subject-specific ones, aren't there? Yes, and some of the databases that we buy aren't included in Library Plus because mm. Library Plus can't search them. Yeah. So um, if you look at your library guide, your subject library guide, your academic librarian will have re recommended other sites that you can use that are specific for your subject. So what is the subject library guide then? How might students get to that? On the library uh, webpage, there's a link to subject guides. So if you click on the box that says subject guides, and then all the different subjects are listed there. And you just click on your subject and find your, your course. And then uh, once you've clicked on that, then you've got lots of different tabs on lots of different topics that are going to be really useful for you, including, as Sally said, the list of databases that are specific to your subject. Mm. I know as a student, I find it really useful because uh, I was a law student and I didn't use Library Plus because we used Westlaw instead yes. and other resources. And I found that out and what resources were available to me through my guide that was made by Caroline, the academic librarian for my area. That's right. And, and obviously, even um, when you use Library Plus, you can still, if you wish to, search those individual databases one by one. Mm -hmm. And I know for some of the health subjects, for example, where students are often expected to do a more systematic research process, that it is recommended that they use those individual databases rather than relying just on Library Plus. It could be a good way to stand out as well, because if you throw the same search term into a different search engine, you might get different results, and that might make you stand out from other students. So I would always go through each different one, one by one, even if the ones I didn't like as much, and I might find one paper extra, and that would be worth my time. Yeah, and for some people, Library Plus, which can generate thousands of results, can be too overwhelming. So sometimes mm. it is a benefit just to search the one specific database because then you're not so overwhelmed by the number of results that you get. That's a really good point that you've made there about the number of results. So Library Plus, is there any key ways that you can get the number of results down? You can limit by year. So obviously in most subjects you would be expected to look at the most recent research mm. and uh, reports. I mean, so for business, for example, you'd be wanting to look in the last five years. Mm -hmm. Obviously, history, yeah. you're going to be keeping that more open, <laughs> so that, that it obviously it depends on your subject, but that's one way to, to limit it. You can also add in a location, so you could put UK if you were looking specifically for uh, research that's been conducted in this country, or a different country, depending on what you're looking for. Um, you could also limit it by uh, things such as gender or age, things like that, depending on what the topic is that you're researching. I think the main point is to become familiar with the Library Plus uh, results screen because if you look on the left hand column you'll see all the different limiters. So you can limit by, as you've just said, by um, date of publication or by adding in extra keywords. But you can also limit by the type of material you're mm. looking at. So it may be that you're only interested in news articles or magazine articles or you may want to look for academic journal articles and all of those are limiters that you can use to apply to your results set. That's really good. Um, as well as the limiters that are on the left hand side, is there any other way to limit the results set that you do get? The main way I would limit it would be by adding in additional um, search words. So for example, Liz mentioned UK. Now this wouldn't limit the number of results, this may possibly extend the number of results because if you're using something like UK, you need to remember that you might need to add in United Kingdom, Great Britain, mm -hmm. England, Ireland, etc, etc. If you were looking for things in America, you've got United States, United mm -hmm. States of America, USA, America. Yeah. So you've got to add North in all those South options. Yeah. You've got to add in all those yeah. options. Um, but in terms of limiting, I think it's the way you limit your results and get them more specific is to really plan those keywords and that mm -hmm. search strategy that we've already mentioned. Okay then. So 
Is there any other piece of advice that you have for research? I would say be systematic and write down everything that you're searching mm -hmm. because it's really easy to get lost and to think, have I searched this one already? Whereas if you've written it down and you've got a clear record of the combinations of search terms that you've used, you know you don't need to, to worry about that one. You would only need to revisit like, as you said before, Alex, that you would potentially be wanting to look for more, inf for newer information yeah. on that that might have come up since you started searching. I think my top tip would be, whichever database you're searching, look for the ability to create your own account within that service. So, for example, mm -hmm. within Library Plus, you can create your own account, and then you can save your research into folders. You can save your searches and rerun them at a later date. Um, and that, that can save an awful lot of time. And most of the databases will have that facility to create your own account yeah. and create your own bookshelf or um, repository of information. That's really useful. I think I would have found that useful as a student. So I didn't create my own account. I just downloaded all the resources and then just put it into folders. Yeah. I, think, I think most students do do that, but it's just another good way of going back to them. And my other tip would be, look at the other tools that are available within those resources, such as um, a handy little citation button mm. that helps you create a reference, or that if you use a reference management package, you can export your references. Yeah. So they're all about saving you time at the end of the day. So speaking about references, uh, later into this podcast, there will be a part about referencing specifically, where we go into more depth about the references, the different reference packages that are available. And in the next part of the podcast, we are going to go into some depth about EndNote uh, with uh, Emma Butler, who is... The resident expert. Yeah, the resident <laughs> expert is what I was going to say. <laughs> so, this advice is great, but where can students go to find further, more detailed advice and information about researching? I would say uh, go to your subject guides and the information that's provided on the library website. Uh, we've got the EYL toolkit, which has got... Uh, tips on researching as well as writing your assignment so everything that's on that website just have an explore see what's there mm -hmm. have a play with it have a look at the um, book a workshop button on the libguides because there's lots of online webinars um, whether it's a session that is thematic um, or whether it's an ask the library type session always come in and have a look for the uh, help available and don't forget the skills guides on the libguides yeah. as well lots of really useful stuff on there well, I know that I often, actually, I went along to quite a few of your online sessions uh, because I'm still a student and I found them really useful. Uh, so yeah, go definitely check out the workshops tool. So now we're going to discuss some students' top tips of research. So we asked students on social media what their top piece of advice were for research. And so here is a few of them. So the first student said, keep track of references so they don't lose them. What do we think about that? I agree completely and that's where, where the t um, tools within those databases to save your research into folders is so handy because it, it is very easy to forget the materials that you've used and then if you don't reference them obviously you're not mm. exp um, expressing that breadth of research that you've done so yes definitely keep your research and your references. Absolutely I've had a lot of students who come and see me and they said oh I've written my assignment and I've now got to find all my references again. Mm -hmm. So absolutely keeping track of them and being systematic and writing it down, recording it or downloading them to, uh, to a referencing tool. Absolutely. So yeah, again, we're going to talk more about EndNote and how that can really help you in the next part. Uh, so the second student said, give it time. Absolutely. I think that you've got to leave as much time for the research as you do for the actual reading and the writing. So you've got to plan that time in and give it plenty of time. And it isn't easy. Mm -hmm. Research is about searching and it is a, can be quite difficult. I think when I was a student, actually, I just spent more time doing my research than writing. The writing bit took me the, the least amount of time. But I'd always feel quite insecure because I was like, actually, I've got nothing done on paper, but I'd have loads of research. And it meant that the writing went really, really quickly. And often I'd find myself going over the work count and be able to pick the best bits because I did my research first. And so, yeah, giving it time, making sure you do the proper research, that's always the crucial bit. But there is a perception, just from what mm. you've just said, there is a perception, I think, out there that actually the writing is the bit that takes the longest. And actually, you should give a third of each, and you a third for the research, a third for your planning, and then a third for your reading, sorry, and then a third for your writing. Very good. So the third student 
uh, agreed with something that's been said before. He said, always plan ahead and never be afraid to broaden your subject area in order to get the best results. Yeah, I think quite often when students come to using search engines like Library Plus, they're so used to using Google that they just think that they can type in, you know, a, a mm. long string of keywords. And, and then they don't find the results that they're looking for. So I think it is worth remembering that if you're doing a specific piece of research, you may need to broaden out your search because there may not have been very much written on what you're researching. And equally, if you, you're looking at a very broad topic, you're going to need to narrow it down to get down to those crucial results that you need. So I think one of the most important things that you highlighted there is about doing multiple searches. So yes. not just sticking in one, one lot of search terms and going, that's everything on my area, that's everything that could possibly be relevant. Trying different things out and doing some, well, research and planning out like you said earlier, Liz. So the fourth student said to use more than just a reading list and that's something we've all already agreed on so far, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And the final student said, control plus F. So what's that? <laughs> That's where you can just get um, your, your computer to search for um, whatever word you've used within the control F box, which is your search box. Um, so you could have a PDF open or a web page open um, and you just do control and F and it will find the words that you're searching for. So it's a very quick way of um, skim reading mm. something. I would say as well, within, if you're using uh, reading an e-book, you can use the search within function in exactly the same way, rather than having to go to the index and search for the, through the index and then look at each page. It's much, much quicker. And then obviously Control plus F does that within your journal articles as well. Yeah, and there isn't an index in journal articles. I actually use Control F a lot as a student, so I'd use it to make to find if a journal is relevant. I would use it with care though, so if you find that it brings up a particular paragraph, I'd probably read the page before the page after, as well as the abstract of the paper rather than just getting the quote and lifting it out without reading the wider context yeah, of it. Yeah, I would agree, because words can mean different things in different contexts. So, you yeah. know, you, you, depending on the word that you're searching for, um, it's the same within a search engine. If you don't use the right words, you're only going to find, you know, you could potentially find irrelevant material. Yeah. Or actually be rejecting material if you're not using, the, you, if the author has used a different word. Like we were talking about synonyms yeah. before, so you need to do it with a variety of different words to ensure that you, you can definitely reject that article. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Use synonyms as much as possible. Also, try when I was using Control F, the biggest piece of advice I'd say is not using the full word. So let's say you were looking for completely, I don't know why you would, but let's say you're looking for completely, you might actually have complete that you miss out if you put completely in. So if you put like complete, that might have more things found. And, and then remember that at the end of that you need to use that asterisk as a wild card. A lot of students don't know about truncation. Okay. And um, so for example, if you were looking for things about children, you yeah. could type in the word, ch word child followed by an asterisk and it would find child, children, mm. childhood, childish, anything that begins with that word and ends in absolutely anything else. So a truncation, which is an asterisk, is a really good research tip. Saves you a lot of time. It does. You don't have to research them all individually. So there are your top tips. I didn't know about that. I've never used that before. Uh, so I'm really grateful that you've gone and taught me that. <laughs> um, so yeah, now we're going to move on the podcast to, now that you've done your research, how can we evaluate the sources that you've read? So this is part of, every time you do a piece of reading, if you found something that you might think is good for your work, you should probably evaluate your sources. So... The first question I've got to ask is, well, what type of sources should students be using in their research? That's a difficult question to answer, I think, mm -hmm. because it can depend so much on what it is that they've got to produce. I agree. So if they're, if they're um, looking at something that may need statistics or government publications, they're going to need the internet, really. Yeah. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with relying on the internet for those resources. But then you think to yourself, who's actually published or written those yeah. statistics or those documents? Um, I think they need to use academic books, academic journal articles, conference papers, things that come from that more educational or professional background. I would always suggest as well that broadly, and again depending on the subject, that you should use a third of each kind of resource, so maybe a third books, a third journal articles and a third other resources which would include those government publications, maybe newspaper articles, podcasts, that kind of thing. 
uh, blogs and so on. Again, like I said, depending on what you're, what you're studying. So, as well as me asking you these questions, I've also got to ask students a, the question of, well, how, would, how do they find if a source is actually trustworthy or credible? And so here's what the student said when I asked them that. So how do you know if a source is reliable? Well, you can look into the author and what their goal was with that source. But even if a source isn't reliable, if it's factually inaccurate, you can still use that if you're arguing against the existence of that source, for example. I use the hierarchy of evidence to look at the categories and I make sure it's peer reviewed. Well, in the modules we get given um, an online reading list or a recommended reading list. This is something that I'll go and get my sources from. So anything that I can access through the library resources such as Westlaw or Lexis, that's usually a lot better than going through Wikipedia or sources that you can just access through Google. I would look at the publisher themselves and, and determine whether I would consider them a reliable source to provide the information on the subject. So the best bet is to use peer-reviewed journal articles so what do we all think about those sources then? I think that generally that's a good, a good, good, lot of good advice given there, that's brilliant. Yeah, I mean it covers a quite a, a wide range of um, things that you need to take into consideration. In terms of the student who mentioned the hierarchy of evidence, that's going to be a sort of a, a systematic methodology of looking at resources. Some subject areas tend to use that type of thing more than others. Um, I know that particularly health courses use uh, very systematic literature searches, literature review processes. Um, I'm not that familiar with hierarchy of evidence, yeah. I have to admit. But it's a subject specific thing and yeah. it's, if it, you will find information about that type of thing on the LibGuides for that particular, particular yeah, subject. Yeah, so and the academics, obviously your tutor's going to talk to you about yeah. that and explain what it means. Um, and it wouldn't just be thrown at you out of the blue as something yeah. that you were expected to understand. So the hierarchy of evidence, the student who, from, who raised that was an occupational therapy student, for right. context. I um, suspected it was going to be a health student. <laughs> yeah. Have you got anything to add, Liz? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just th talking about... Um, we mentioned about the author and purpose, so it's really important to look at who has put the information out there, whatever kind of source it is, even if it is a peer-reviewed journal or a piece of research that's published in an art, uh, a journal article or as a journal article. It's always important to look at why that piece of research was conducted, because it's quite possible that it may have been sponsored by a particular company that wanted a particular answer. So it's always a good idea to sort of look beyond what you see on the fate on the paper mm. of the journal article, just mm. to see what that purpose was, and make sure that there's there's no uh, vested interests there, as well as the considering the bias that might be there. If that person is a specialist in that subject, that's absolutely fantastic. But of course, they may well have a quite a strong confirmation bias about that. So it's a good good idea to really look at criticisms of those theories and of that research as well, and to develop your own as you're doing your wider mm. reading. One of the students mentioned about um, it's okay to use an, a journal article if it's inaccurate. I think um, that is true, but obviously you can't just say, in my opinion, this is inaccurate. Mm. You've got to read and find the evidence yeah. that supports that. Um, and find it probably a counterpoint. To point exactly, and, and ideas do change over time. Um, you know, subjects develop and arguments develop and what was sort of belief some time ago may no longer be belief so yeah. it's not that it's inaccurate it may just be that that has changed it could be inaccurate if you if you question the methodology that the researchers have used um, in their project then again you form that opinion but you've got to back it up with other evidence so that particular student again that was a history student right and i think what's crucial that's coming up in this conversation is Depends on what subject, you, depending on what subject you're doing, there's different questions you can ask and different ways to analyse sources in your area. So, for example, a health student might ask, "How big is the sample size?" Whereas in my subject, in my discipline, I would never ask that no. because we didn't have that as we don't have sample sizes. Um, so, what questions might students be able to ask then if they are questioning a source? Well, one of the um, students in that interview mentioned peer review, yeah. and um, you were asking. We were talking earlier on about the types of material, and and academic journals tend to be what is called peer reviewed, and mm -hmm. that's just an academic process that um, the major quality um, academic publishers um, undertake. So, uh, authors would submit an article to a journal. It would be sent out to peers. That's other people working in that area. 
for comment and criticism and feedback, which is then sent back to the original mm. authors, and they may then have to review or revise that article. So it's gone through that whole editorial process, which gives it that quality benchmark, really. So peer-reviewed journal articles are really strong academic sources. Mm -hmm. And quite often, if you're not sure if a journal is peer-reviewed, if you um, even just Google that journal and go to the home page and look for a section that might say about this journal, it will tell you if it's peer-reviewed mm -hmm. or not. That's good to know. It's yeah. an, uh, just, just thinking as well, we haven't actually mentioned Google Scholar specifically, have we? Mm -hmm. But obviously some of you might be aware of that. Google Scholar is a place where you can find some of these articles. We would always recommend Library Plus, of course. One of the reasons is because actually sometimes those articles that are rejected by peer review may well end up on Google Scholar. So you may be thinking, oh, this is really good, it's a journal article, or you know, it's been written by this researcher. But it may well have been rejected by one of those peer review uh, processes, in which case you're not getting the absolute quality that you think you are. So I've got a controversial question now that I'm going to ask. So one of the students mentioned about Wikipedia and how they would not potentially use that as a recommended source. Do you think that there's still use in using Wikipedia at all? I think, again, it depends very much on how you use Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of academics don't like Wikipedia yeah. being used in your reference list, so perhaps it's good to steer clear of it in that respect. Yeah. Um, but always check, the uh, again, the authority of the authors of that Wikipedia article, look at the references that they've quoted mm -hmm. and cited within that article, and that will give you... And also go back and verify that that information is correct. You know, in the early days of Wikipedia, um, the criticism was around the fact that anybody could... Yeah publish an article and so therefore it could be completely inaccurate and a lot of them, or not a lot of them, some of them are, it's probably not fair to say a lot, um, but you've got to um, engage your evaluation techniques yeah. and look at who's written it, when was it written, etc. It's always a good idea to triangulate the facts that you find on Wikipedia, make sure that you see them repeated in other reputable sources and then you can rely on that. So the reason why I ask you is because I actually use Wikipedia as the, one of the starting points of my essay. So to get the a very broad overview of a topic, I use Wikipedia to get my head around what the topic is, and then I do some wider reading, I look at the sources the, the lectures have given me, I look at the reading list and things. So I just thought that would be interesting to see what your opinion was of that. I use Wikipedia to find out about a topic, yeah. but I don't think I'd ever use it within an academic piece of work. But I think as a background, it's just like yeah. Google, isn't it? You, If you're not sure about what something is, you Google it, find out, and yeah. then you know the keywords to use. That's exactly why I so use it. So you can use a Wikipedia article to to um, populate your search strategy. Yeah. Yeah. But I've never included it in my reference list. No, and I think that's the key, isn't it? Is it that once you've got that background from Wikipedia, then you do your wider reading, you yeah. will f probably find out everything that you've got from Wikipedia within your wider reading, and then that's what you reference instead. Yeah. So is there any other thing else about uh, ha checking sources that you'd like to uh, m mention in this podcast? Um, I think if you're using web resources, it's the W's, who, when, why, what, so who published it, when did they publish it, why, is there any bias, what is their background, is it a government website as opposed to a charity if it's a charity um you know what is their message are they trying to get over um a viewpoint think of greenpeace for example mm. um so you know you've just got to use those um detective skills really in evaluating web resources particularly i think they are the most difficult because the when is quite often difficult to find you know you know dates on web pages can be really mm -hmm. difficult to see yeah I agree with you on that. If, so, yeah. I was just going to say, I'm going to come back to bias a little bit because um, we've talked about potential bias in the writing, but obviously if you have an opinion on this topic, then you've also got to counter your own personal bias. So don't just look for bits of information that back up what you want to say about this topic. That's a good you point. You should be it looking wider and be thinking, okay, what, do, what other critics of, are there? Um, and include those in your writing as well, and then you will not be presenting a biased view. Yeah, I agree with that. Look at both sides of things. It's very easy if you have a one, if you, in everyday life, if you subscribe to one point of view, you can easily see that point of view. Whereas if you don't see the people who go against it, then you can't challenge that. Absolutely. And also, can help your evidence critical thinking. Mm -hmm. If you do want to find more information about evaluating sources, 
then you can find information on our evaluating sources skills guide that has been made by the academic librarian team. Um, that There is a link to that in the description of this podcast. But yes, that will wrap up this podcast. So what we will talk about in the next episode of the podcast is about organising research using tools such as EndNote, and Mendeley and other online tools to organise research as well as also ways that you can plan how you can write out your assignment. For that podcast, I will be joined by Emma Butler of the Research Librarian team at the University of Derby. But for now, thank you to my special guest. Thank you for all your advice and wisdom, and thank you for your time and coming on today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And thank you very much for listening. Bye.